for over 39 million Americans. The theme this last week was come, let's go. As they crowded the airports and the highways, indeed, it was Thanksgiving Day. The food, the mountains of mashed potatoes, the cranberry sauce, the gravy, the turkey, the dressings. The theme of the day was, let's go, let's eat, let's eat a little more, and then the desserts. Remember Thanksgiving Day? You still may be remembering it. For some celebrated it Thursday, some celebrated it Wednesday because of uh, two families to go, some celebrated it Friday, and some of you are still carrying around Friday's leftovers with you today as you snacked on it this morning. The food, the feast, the family, the friends, the conversation. We had all of that and more. And we kind of finished with a conversation. And of all places that conversation went, went you can never guess what's happened recently in our society. It's the place that you probably don't want to necessarily go. Of course, half of America is not pleased with the selection process, and the other half probably isn't real thoughtful of it either. And we live in this time of just kind of what do we do now time as a nation. The conversations, the concerns, the passionate exchange, the drive back home was the capstone of the day for me. Because as I pressed uh, the button for the radio, and indeed, there came on a Christmas carol. And I said, Thanksgiving, and next is Christmas. And my spirit just settled in. I love this time of year. How about you? I think there's something that is lost when we have Thanksgiving followed, Thursday Thanksgiving followed by, what do they call Friday? Black Friday because it's the day that all of the commerce is done and billions of dollars are spent and the department stores go into the black. Business and commercial, commercialism losing the spirit of the season, moving from Thanksgiving to Christmas. So I'd invite you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter two this morning. We're going to look there. Isaiah chapter two is our anchor text. But as you open your Bibles to um, Isaiah chapter 2, it must be said in context. Because in Isaiah chapter 1, there's a message that was given to the people. And then we will go to chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. Wash yourselves clean, take your evil deeds out of my sight, uh, and stop doing wrong. Verse 17 in Isaiah chapter 1 says, Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. And against that background, we enter into Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. As the highest of the mountains, it will be exalted above the hills. And all nations will stream to it. We first look at Isaiah chapter 2 as a call. It is a call to come up and let us be on our way as a people moving to the mountain of the Lord. But you say, where is the mountain of the Lord? Mountains were... Uh, The mountain of the Lord and the theme of God's mountain in the Old Testament was well known to the people. Some of the significant mountains of the Old Testament, Mount Ararat, 
where the Ark of Noah rested. Mount Moriah, you'll recall, was the place where Abraham offered Isaac. Mount Sinai, as you remember, the Mount of the Lord for what? The Ten Commandments. You're good Bible students. Mount Carmel, where, uh, where the showdown was between Elijah, the prophet of God, and the false prophets of Baal. The Mount of Beatitudes, where Jesus shared uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Mount Calvary, though not, not a mountain, where Jesus gave his life. And Mount of Olives, uh, where Jesus' earthly ministry occurred. So we have the imagery of the Mount, of people going to the Mount, seeking the Lord, the highest of all mountains. Mountains are not a real familiar um, a, re a real familiar thing. We have hills in California. We're at about a thousand feet, uh, plus or minus, here in Santa Clarita. Some of the mountains in California ascend to the tens of thousands of feet. Having spent 20 plus years in Colorado, they have 14 14ers that I know of. So if you're going to go on, on a hike to a, uh, to a mountain, it's often a hike where you might start at 6,000 feet and ascend to 11 or 12,000 feet. It's a vigorous hike at that. So come, walk with Jesus is the clarion call of Isaiah chapter 2. As we look at that, what it means to walk with Jesus, just follow along. Um, it will be exalted, the mountain will be exalted above all hills, and all nations or all people will stream to it. Many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of Jacob. He will teach us his way so that we might walk in his paths. The, the law will go out from Zion. The word will go out of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge the nations. He will settle the disputes from the many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. I like that call, don't you? God's people will come to his mountain, walk in his ways, and there will be transformation among his people. How is it that even amongst God's people, we get so polarized so quickly when we have a conversation? Has it, has it ever happened with you where you're just so passionate, you can't wait to get your thought across? That you stop the conversation and interrupt and have to have your say before you listen. Has it ever happened in your life? I know I find myself retrospectively exiting a conversation sometimes going, whoa, you should have reeled in those remarks a long time before you spoke. And sometimes part of the dynamics and part of the passion is just the sense of urgency, which is good to be expressed in a very dispassionate way. First by listening, seeking understanding, then expressing one's point of view. But there is a walk with Jesus. There is a walk, there is a way, and there is a watching for him as well. Because it is promised he will teach us his ways that we may walk where? In his, in his what? In his what? In his paths, as Isaiah says. So have you found the path? Today is the question that God wants you to walk in. I believe, friends, it's first and foremost a path of service to others. Whether you're seven, 17, or 71, there is a walking in the way of service to others. 
Come, let us go up and walk in the way of Christ as he gave his life a service. The story is told of a young girl named Jane who was only seven years old when she visited a shabby street in a nearby town and seeing the ragged children there announced that she wanted to build a big house so others who were less fortunate than her could have a place to play. When she was a young adult, Jane and a friend visited Townby Hall in London where they saw educated people helping the poor by living among them and with them. Jane and her friend returned to Chicago restored an old mansion and moved in. There they cared for the children of the city, children of working mothers, and held sewing and cooking classes. Older boys and girls had clubs in the mansion, an art gallery, public music, reading, and craft rooms were created too. Her dream had finally come true. But Jane didn't stop there. She spoke. She spoke up for people who couldn't speak for themselves. She eventually was awarded an honorary degree from Yale. President Roosevelt dubbed her America's most useful citizen. She was later, she was later granted and awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. In spite of her worldwide fame, Jane Addams remained a resident of Hall House for the rest of her life. She died there in service, in the heart of the slum she had come to call home. The way of Christ is his way of living to serve others. Isaiah calls us to come, to come up to serve as Christ has served others. But not only is there the call of service, but there's the call to walk in the way. As our scripture reading today continues in Romans 13, the way is a way of righteousness and walking in the fullness of light that Christ has called us to. For Romans chapter 13 verses 11 through 14 reads, And this do understand the present time. The hour is late and has already come to you. Wake up out of your slumber. It was 4.30, it was 4, 4 o'clock a.m. Thanksgiving morning when I heard the alarm go off. That alarm was set by my wife. I turned over and went back to sleep for another hour. She got up to make the food and prepare the things of that day. Come with us. Wake up from your slumber and walk in the way, Paul is saying, because our salvation is now nearer than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us set aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of all Light. Do you like that description? Moving out of the ways of darkness, the ways of selfishness, let us come and walk in the ways of the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. To behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing of drunkenness, not in sexual immorality, botchery, not in dissension, not in jealousy, Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh, but the wishes of the Lord Jesus Christ in the way that you walk in the light and in the path of righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come, let us go. Let us walk in the ways. Let us walk in the light. John chapter 8, verse 12, tells us that Jesus is indeed the light of the world. As we lean upon him and walk in his light, we will serve him day by day. 
that those who are younger than us, those who are older than us, those who are our neighbors, those who are our friends, those who are our colleagues at work, might notice something different about our lives. That when the darkness of light presses in, Christ is there magnifying his light and drawing us to the light. Have you ever been in darkness? Darkness in dark spots of your life? Sometimes darkness creeps in ever so slowly. It's not intentional, but it's a little bit of neglect. It's a little bit of, I'm not sure where to go, but I know I think what I don't want is that nagging spirit that calls me sometimes this way. I just want to ignore it. And we slip gradually away from that which calls us to Christ. Our conscience for just a moment is dull, but Christ in his patience calls us back, calls us back. So there's a way and there's a walk with Christ in the light. I find it interesting, I find it interesting in Isaiah Going back for just a moment to Isaiah chapter 2. So he says, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the, of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we might walk in his paths. And the law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge all nations and he will settle disputes for many peoples and he will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of, J of Jacob, let us walk in the light of what? The light of the Lord. I like this imagery for a reason. I like this imagery in light of Thanksgiving Day. You, you don't quite get the connection quite yet. I didn't either immediately. After all of this instruction from Isaiah, he says he'll teach us his ways. He'll teach us to walk in his paths. And he'll come among the people. And he'll settle all the disputes among the people. And then there's this kind of nonsensical thing that he'll beat their swords into what? Into plowshares. I didn't get it at first. Because we don't carry swords today. We don't really carry swords. Well, we carry <laughs> some different kinds of swords that inflict as much pain as the, sword, the real swords. <laughs> the swords of our tongue at times. But nonetheless, the imagery of the day. Do you see it? The sword is a weapon of offense. It's something that's going to injure, destroy and take a life, and it's beaten down, and it's transformed, and it goes into the ground as a plow. And the seed is dropped in to the ground, and the seed springs forth food, and the food bears forth fruit, and the fruit on the table provides Food, and as you gather around the table, it unites. In imagery, that which would take a life is transformed by Christ into that which provides life. He will settle all differences if we will give him our swords, he will transform them into plowshares, into bringing forth an abundance of things that will unite rather than divide, rather than harm, and rather than bruise and kill and injure. And in many times and in many circumstances, it's only his spirit that can do that. 
We live in an interesting time where there is a walk and there is a way, but there is also the watch this time of year. Our scripture reading from Matthew 24, verse 42 says, Therefore, keep watch, because you, don't, you do not know on what day the Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time the night of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would have not left his house to be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come as an, at an hour when you do not expect him. So the call today is to come up to walk in his way and to watch and be ready. We have so much to be thankful in this Thanksgiving season. And just as they watched for the coming of Christ, we watch for his return. How is it in your life, friend? Are you walking in his way? Are you watching for his coming? Have you yielded your spirit to him that his spirit might fill your heart and your life for service for him, to him, and for others? Let us pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of your only begotten Son. We thank you, Father, for the message written on the sacred pages of Scripture. And Father, during this season of year, as we move from giving thanks to honoring the birth of your Son, Fill us with your spirit as we come up and walk with you, as we walk in the pathway filled with your light, that we might determine today, Father, to watch and be ready. For we ask it through Christ's precious name. Amen.